Physicist Michael Kostelich was jointly awarded the 2016 Nobel Prize in Physics. He did research on proposing a new method in understanding substances through the phase transition in the change of the state of 2D topological materials with Professor David J. Thaulis, who was his teacher 42 years ago. At first, his study was not acknowledged by the academic world. But now, after 40-something years, it is considered an important discovery in the world of condensed matter physics. Professor Michael Kostelich also has special ties with Korea. His relationship with Korea first began in 2004 in the Korea Institute for Advanced Study. The relationship still continues and he has sparked the light for pure science in Korea. Let's learn about his life and principles that open up a new reign in physics in this edition of the interview. Hello and welcome to the interview. We have a Nobel laureate in our studio today. It is my pleasure to welcome Professor Michael Kostolitz, who received Nobel Prize in Physics in 2016. Hello, Professor. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Pleased to be here. <laughs> so uh, speaking of which, in December in 2016, you were awarded Nobel Prize in Physics. Yeah. And uh, you also received many congratulations, right? Oh, yes. Does it feel real now? Um, reality is beginning to set in, but uh, I have been living in a bubble of unreality since the announcement way back in October. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So in your speech, you talked about how luck and a coincidence helped you get the prize. Would you elaborate on that for us? Uh, I was a high-energy physicist who had failed to uh, be accepted to go to CERN in Geneva, which was the natural place to go. And so I found a couple of jobs and applied and was accepted for, to Birmingham University in Britain. Mm -hmm. Carried on doing high energy physics for a year unsuccessfully. And then in desperation, I was walked around from office to office asking people if they had a problem I could look at. I found myself in David Thaler's office uh, where he was talking about all sorts of weird and wonderful ideas mm -hmm. which were about which I knew absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. um, topology, vortices, dislocations, and so on. I went away, you know, where I didn't understand very much, but the ideas basically made sense. Mm -hmm. And so I went back to my own little office and started thinking about them and I suppose you can say the rest is history. So I think one has to say that this series of uh, accidents and, and mm -hmm. luck and coincidences um, were essential. Well, three professors were awarded for the work on the condensed matter physics. We should talk about their respective roles. All right. The Nobel Prize was actually given for two separate but, relate, but related pieces of work. Mm -hmm. uh, the Nobel Prize was awarded for the basically the applications of topology to condensed matter physics. Mm -hmm. The piece of work I was involved in with David Thaulis is purely classical, no quantum mechanics involved. And then uh, that was done at Birmingham University mm -hmm. in Britain. Then David, a couple of years later, David Thaulis left Birmingham and went to Seattle where he worked on the applications of topology to quantum mechanics. So the second piece of work for which the Nobel Prize was given was for topology in quantum mechanics, and the people involved in that were David Thaulis 
and Duncan Aldain, mm -hmm. and of course some others. But so the Nobel Prize was actually split four ways. Mm -hmm. Each so between these four people, uh, each person got each person got an, a quarter. But there's a rule that the Nobel Prize can't be given to more than three people. But it so happened that two of the four people happened to be the same person, David Thaulis. So I see. the prize was ever split. To three people. Duncan and me a quarter each, right. and David got a half, because he was involved in both pieces <laughs> of work. I see, I see. Which is a very fair division. Right. Going back to my previous question, you were awarded for your work on condensed matter physics. Now, that's way beyond my understanding in physics. Could you explain a little bit about your field? Well, I mean, condensed matter physics is really the study of how many, many particles interact with each other and what the, the properties, or the emergent properties, if you wish, of this, of a huge number of particles all interacting with each other. Mm -hmm. So the sort of thing that happens when you, uh, when, when you have this situation are changes of state. Like, for example, uh, if you heat water up, it, it turns to steam. On the other hand, if you cool water down enough, it turns to ice. So, mm -hmm. so condensed matter is a study of these sorts of phenomena. Mm -hmm. Well, you said something about it all made sense to you before, and how did you get to focus on the 2D topological materials? When I was in Birmingham, as I said, I ended up in David Thaler's right. office. He was talking about all sorts of uh, strange phenomena. Then there was an awful lot of unsolved problems in two-dimensional two systems mm -hmm. because there was a conflict between experiment and some rigorous theorems. So the rigorous theorems are certainly correct. Mm -hmm. And the interpretation said that a phase transition in the sort of systems we, we all eventually considered was not possible in two dimensions. So the, but an experiment existed which clearly showed that the, the phase transition did exist. This was in a, in a film of uh, liquid helium. Mm -hmm. So there's this conflict or contradiction between the interpretation of the rigorous theorems and experiment. Mm -hmm. And so we looked at into these two-dimensional systems and realized that there was something else going on. Mm -hmm. Well, what impresses me about your study is that it endures time. You began this study 40 years ago, and at the time, your study was different from the traditional notion of 2D topological no, material. It, it no? was no, very different. Very different. So when your work was first published, what were some reactions? Uh, it was ignored. It was ignored. <laughs> Basically, we hardly got any, uh, our paper was hardly referred to at all really? for the first few years. First few uh, more years? More than two, I think. But right now, you get like thousand uh, citations, uh, right? Yes, yeah. Then people started catching on mm -hmm. that maybe we'd done something real, mm -hmm. and then it just grew from there. Right. So it took 40 years for them to understand, actually. It, it caught on, actually, the first experiment that was done to, that proved our theory or verified our theory was actually done and published in 1978, mm. so four, four years or so after we had put forward this, uh, this theory. And actually it turned out that John Reppy and his uh, graduate student at Cornell had been studying um, films of liquid helium for some time, and they had some data, mm. which, um, you know, just a set of points which seemed to follow a straight line. Mm -hmm. uh, then they weren't aware of our theory. And then somebody pointed out that a prediction had ah, already been made about already, this slope. Already made by. So, yeah, and then so de so John and his graduate student drew the straight line, mm -hmm. and. 
went right through the experimental data. And the vital predict theoretical prediction is actually implicit in the work of that David Thales and I did, but we'd never actually um, um, spelled it out in detail. But then in 1977, David Nelson, who was a very smart uh, graduate student at Cornell and was then a, a, a Harvard fellow, and I actually worked out the mathematics of this, and came up with a prediction which, if you like, was a sort of smoking gun in that it, it, was, a, it was a prediction that a certain experimentally measurable quantity should be some number. Mm -hmm. And if, this, if the experiment was done and it came out with a value different from our prediction, mm -hmm. then our theory had to be wrong and one would have to go back to the drawing board. Mm. But um, the experiment agreed you know, spot on with the, right. with the prediction. So that meant that the theory it was probably correct. Was correct. Well, it's hard, but it's very, the process it sounds very interesting. We'll talk more about your, um, your study and your life after watching this video clip. Okay. Professor Taulis. Professor Haldane. The Nobel Professor Prize Paul ceremony was held in Stockholm, Sweden on December 10th last year. The 2016 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to those who studied the change in substances in the world of two-dimension materials. The notion of topology was inducted and the study explains the topological phase transition of thin 2D materials. The forms of substances are largely divided into gas, solids and liquids. The topological phase transition explains a transformation from gas to liquids and to solid forms. We easily think that solids and liquids take up space and are three-dimension substances, but solids and liquids as thick as an atom can exist in 2D material form. Substances like graphene is an allotrope in two-dimension solid form. There is a unique material whose properties change when extremely high or low pressure and a change in temperature are applied to two-dimension substances. Topology is concerned with the properties of space that are preserved under continuous deformations. For example, bread without any holes and a rice ball are topological objects as they can be made into the same forms when they undergo transformation. A donut with a hole is like a cup with a handle. They are topologically the same as pretzel with two holes and a pair of glasses. Two-dimension solid forms are the same as the surface of a calm lake. If there is an increase of pressure and temperature, vortex can be formed on the lake and they will be similar to bread with holes in it. The surface of a calm lake and its form with vortex are topologically different substances. The outcome of the research changed the existing theory and it is considered an important discovery in the study of condensed matter physics in the 20th century. I also found out that you used to study particle physics instead of um, condensed matter physics. And why the shift in your focus? I did my PhD in particle physics because that was a glamorous subject. Mm -hmm which uh, all, all physicists wanted to do at the time. Then I went as a postdoc to Torino in Italy mm -hmm. and continued on particle physics and was doing long, tedious calculations. Then I, remember I, I told you I failed to get into CERN, which right. is a natural place to go, so I, I ended up in Birmingham where I continued doing these long calculations. But, and I was just about to write, start writing up my calculation when a preprint arrived from on my desk, which was doing, did exactly what I was intending to do, mm -hmm. and just done. Mm -hmm. And this came from a group in Berkeley. So I thought, okay, then I, these things happen. And mm -hmm. so I started doing another calculation. I just finished it 
I was about to write it up as a paper when a preprint arrived and on then my desk another, from the yeah. same group in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And so I, I decided twice is too much. I can't compete with large groups from America, and so I decided to go and look for some other problem. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I was talking to all sorts of people, but the most interesting ideas were in condensed matter mm -hmm. from, through David Thaulis. And so I said I worked on that. Mm -hmm. I didn't care where the physics came from. I was just, I was just a postdoc. Right. And I just wanted to do something. I wanted to do some, some research. So mm -hmm. I didn't mind if it was right. uh, high energy or, or condensed matter. Mm -hmm. Well, you are currently staying in Korea doing research. Could yeah. you tell us about your research here? Non-equilibrium theory? Is it well, that's what I came to try to look at. But, of course, uh, this Nobel Prize intervened. So, and this the winter has been a special began. time. So I haven't had any time to do any, mm -hmm. any, any real work. But out of equilibrium, the study of out of equilibrium, equilibrium systems is very important because if you look around in the real world, every system you see is not, it's out of equilibrium. Mm. And every system is evolving towards some, some state. Mm -hmm. Maybe very slow, maybe fast. Because uh, theoretically, uh, one doesn't care about the speed of the process. All, one, all I was interested in was what is the final state? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to try to understand if there's a way of computing this final state. So that, was, that has been the object of my research in mm. out of equilibrium mm -hmm. uh, systems, but it's not too successful. And not so, yet. Not well. <laughs> uh, I doubt it'll be successful because it's a very difficult problem. Well, well Dr. Kostelitz's ties with Korea goes way back. We'll talk more about this after watching the video clip. Professor Michael Kostelich is over the age of 70, but the impetus behind his research activities stems from his father, an acclaimed biochemist who had a profound influence on him since he was young. His father, Dr. Hans Kostelich, is best known for his work as one of the key discoverers of endorphins. Even after his retirement, he studied and did research until he was 90 years old. Research has naturally been a part of Michael Kostelich's life. He first visited Korea in 2004 through a program for researchers at the Korea Institute for Advanced Study. I like Korea a lot, uh, especially I like Kiosk because I'm not under any pressure to uh, produce something in some particular uh, narrow um, field, but I am allowed to explore things I haven't had a chance to look at before. The Korea Institute for Advanced Study was founded in October of 1996 with the aim to become the world's leading research institute, where international elite scholars gather and dedicate themselves to fundamental research and basic sciences. Fellow professors at Kias think of Professor Michael Kotzelich as a close colleague and family. So that's my question. Is this vortex only possible defect that can exist into the... In the two-dimensional case, <clears throat> the vortex is simple because there are points, although the flow... During his stay in Korea, he does some researches as well as other activities, which includes holding lectures for students and scientists. He credits his award to luck. But uh, he was well prepared and uh, brave enough to tackle new ideas at the time. Although he will be busier, but he will keep visiting us such that we can have, say, a share time with him and share some of his wisdom. Every year you do research in Korea's Institute for Advanced Study. Could you tell us about your experience as a professor in Korea? 
Well, the reason I come here is mostly because I had this very smart uh, graduate student from Korea, and now he, is, he has a position in the Korea Institute for Advanced Study, and he has uh, uh, access to money, and so I like to, I like to come here t to work where I'm left in peace and quiet, and I get paid, so I can't ask for much more. So basically, that's why I come here, so that I can do research mm -hmm. without any pressure. Without any pressure. And, yes. you know, interruptions right. and so on and so forth. Well, during your time here, you meet or will meet a lot of um, young, ambitious, and smart Korean researchers. And yes. I'm sure they aspire Nobel Prize. And, you know, this as one aspect of this prize is that it is given for the basic science, right? So could you tell us, uh, what, do, what, is, what are your thoughts about this value of basic science then? Well, basic science is important mm -hmm. because <clears throat> all right, the idea of basic science is to understand how the world works. Right. Once you've understood how the world works, then the, you leave it to a very, uh, you know, very smart people, applied physicists and engineers, to actually come up with a device mm -hmm. using the knowledge that already exists. Right. You can't, it's too much to expect a single person, a single group to do both things, both the basic science <clears throat> and then, and then applied apply science. it because, and that's just too much. Right. Perhaps <clears throat> there are a couple of geniuses somewhere who can do that sort of thing, but uh, I can't imagine uh, first doing the basic science. <laughs> Because I mean, after all, you want to build a device. And to build a device, you've got to know how the device is going to work. But in order to do that, you have to know where you're going to start from. Mm -hmm. You have to understand the starting point. And that is, what, that is the basic science. The basic the science, starting too. Point. But if you don't know your starting point, how can you build a device? Right. Well, now that you have earned the highest recognition as a Nobel laureate, what would be your next goal? Uh, my immediate goal is to survive the hoopla <laughs> and <clears throat> then, you know, have some, get some peace and quiet to right. do the research I really want to do. Only trouble is I'm getting a bit old for that and uh, you know, I don't know if I'll be able to be able to do it anymore, but, so, but I'll try. Well, this is the interview's official question. I'm sure there are young, ambitious physicists watching this show right now. Would you give them a piece of uh, advice or the words of wisdom that you could give them to our viewers? The only words of wisdom I can give mm -hmm. is do what you like doing or mm -hmm. what you love doing. Who knows, it might lead to something important or it might not. But in any event, since nobody knows what the next, pro what the next important piece of work is, you might as well do what you lo lo love doing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Professor Kostelis, it was an honor to have you in our studio. And thank you so much for sharing your passion and knowledge with us. We look forward to your future studies. Thank you very much, and it was an honor to be here and talk to you.